Welcome, everybody. We are getting started here with our first keynote of the conference. I mean, I can't think of a better way to start this conference off with this beautiful individual right here. Um, we are going to get started in just a second, though, but welcome to everyone who's coming into the room. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're going to give folks just a couple of minutes to get in, but I know I'm excited. I'm trying to hold my mule over here. We're going to wait for y'all to get on in the room. <laughs> yes, hold my mule. We got started a little earlier, giving folks all the housekeeping, all the things. Mad love again to the executive director of Spark Reproductive Justice now, Dr. Crystal Redmond, the amazing team, the amazing board, all the sponsors, all the folks who have made Justice Now 2020 the reality that we are in right now, even in this beautiful virtual world, we get to make this connection at this, at this, at this, at this time that's so important, so necessary. Um, and I'm excited that we get to be in these liberatory conversations with each other over the course of this weekend. So we are going to get started here. Welcome again for those um, folks who are um, joining us for the first time. Welcome to Justice Now 2020. If you've been with us all day, we've had amazing pre-conferences throughout the day. We had a great opening session of beautiful grounding by Bronte Velez, who just really brought us into our heart space, rooted us into um, this beautiful land recognition of where we all are, recognition of Black life. It was just a powerful way um, to start our conference off and to build our connection across these virtual lines here today. But we are now ready for our first keynote speaker. And again, I could not be any more excited than to introduce this amazing, beautiful human being to you all today. So I want to introduce to some and to present to others, the amazing Deshaun Harrison. Deshaun is a non-binary abolitionist, community organizer, and writer based in Atlanta, Georgia. Harrison once served as the communications director for hashtag ATL is ready and editor in chief of queer black millennial queer black millennial Harrison now holds the honor of being the associate editor editor of wear your voice magazine and lead organizers organizer of solutions not punishments collaborative snapco as we call them in the streets. Harrison travels throughout the United States and abroad to speak at conferences, colleges, and to lead workshops focused on Blackness, queerness, gender, class, religion, disabilities, fatness, and the intersection of which they all meet. So I love to read bios, but I love even more to just give love to the beautiful folks who are just bringing so much brilliance to the world, bringing so much of their expertise, their own lived experience and their own stories to us. And that is exactly what Deshaun is gonna be able to do for us today. So I now wanna turn it over to this amazing soul. Deshaun, thank you for joining us at Justice Now 2020. The floor is yours, my love. Monica, thank you so much. You're so beautiful and so kind, thank you. Um, hey everyone, I am so excited to be here and talking with y'all today at this year's Justice Now conference. Um, I have been in love with Spark and Sister Song for so long. Um, all, you know, this is ATL, so we all know each other. We all organizing together. Um, so I'm thankful to be here. Um, my name is Deshaun Harrison. I am Black. I am fat. I am queer. I am trans and I am disabled. I am a lover. I am a sibling. I'm the last born of my mom's children. <laughs> I am a reader. I consider myself a music aficionado and I'm a Netflix connoisseur. <laughs> I start with this because so often we forget that we are a lot of things outside of the work and the labor that we provide. Um, so I always try to introduce myself with that first. Beyond that, I am a writer and an essayist. I'm an editor. I am an author. <laughs> That's kind of new for me. So it's like, wow, I'm hearing it out loud for the first time. Um, and I am a community organizer. I want to thank Crystal, the entire Spark staff, Sister Song, and everyone else who made this happen um, for having me and for always being so gracious to me. Ever since I've known all of you, you have been nothing but gracious and I thank you for that. So the theme for today is radical organizing. 
since I was first asked to do this keynote, I have been contemplating what I would say. There is so much to say about radical organizing and organizing in general. But given that we are just on the other side of what has been named the most important election of modern history, I think this theme is fitting. Not because I believe that organizing around a presidential election is radical, I don't, but rather because the election brought up a few themes worth exploring. So today I want to talk briefly about the election, the history of radical black Southern organizing, the importance of decentralized leadership and community organizing, my work in the last few years, anti and the anti-blackness and removing black radical struggle from our analysis around the geopolitics of the South. Just weeks ago, Americans turned out in record numbers to vote in what is, again, being referred to as the most important election of modern history. As Biden has reminded us throughout his campaign and since being elected as the next president, there were many red states and many blue states. Because of the nature of this year's election, with more mail-in votes than usual, it seemed as though all states were voting as they always had. During that time, social media was flooded with largely anti-Black sentiments about the South and its usefulness, or lack thereof. Viral tweets made their rounds naming that Flint deserved its dirty water, that New Orleans deserved a second Katrina, that Florida, specifically Miami, deserved no resources or care for the next hurricane it was sure to experience. The South was marked, as it so often is during election season, as useless, worthless and otherwise unimportant to the maintenance of America's so-called democracy. And then the mail-in votes from Metro Atlanta started to be counted. With the possibility of the South being the country's quote, saving grace by flipping blue, the narrative has suddenly shifted. For months, there were endless viral tweets about voter suppression in the South, where an overwhelming number of black people live. On any given day ending in Y, you'll find tweets talking about the work of Rosa Parks and MLK or the horrendous experiences of students like Ruby Bridges. In this year alone, the world has lost several civil rights giants and there has not been a day that has gone by where their names, their stories and their fights have not been used as political props to push political agendas. And yet when it came down to the wire, the people being blamed for the results of this election were Southerners instead of Trump supporters, white supremacy, and anti-Blackness, of which there is no home. One could argue that when they name the South in this situation, it is to name voter suppression and overall white supremacy. But as the targeted cities are largely Black and the South itself is largely Black, these statements simply are not apolitical. The South's usefulness has never only been in voting, however, and that's what I wanna talk about today. From the moment we were dragged to this land, shackled and bound by chains of anti-Blackness and colonization, our usefulness has been in our ability to resist radically in many capacities. Through song, the captured sang instructions for freedom roots and messages of encouragement for the journey ahead sometimes referred to as slave songs, jubilees, or songs of the Underground Railroad. These songs held messages that made clear the passage through the troubled waters and firm ground that would lead to freed states for those who were captured. Revolution was born in the South through the slave, not just through the Underground Railroad, but through uprisings too. Historians have found somewhere between 200 and 350 slave revolts occurred in the US prior to the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. So though this idea that the South is only white or that the Negro in the South is docile and meek has been passed through time, it's unfounded, built on falsities intended to downplay the importance that the South has played and continues to play to radical organizing in this country. Through rivers we crossed, at slave masters we charged. That's Southern history, a history that has been passed down through time and instructs how we protest today. 
We may no longer sing Wade in the Water at protest, but you'd be hard pressed to find a protest where chants, rallying cries, and freedom songs are echoing throughout the city. And after this past summer, y'all know the summer we just had, there is no denying the fact that, revo that the revolutionary spirit of our ancestors still lives on today. But revolutionary work didn't start and end there. We kept going, committed to actualizing a different tomorrow. The South would soon give birth to some of the world's most radical thinkers, organizers, and scholars, and to movements that made it possible, made it impossible, excuse me, to ignore the fact that Black people would continue in the, the Black radical tradition founded in the South. From Harriet Tubman and Nat Turner to Ida B. Wells and W.E.B. Du Bois. From Martin Luther King Jr. to Rosa Parks. From Fannie Lou Hamer to Ella Baker. From Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale to Angela Davis and Kathleen Cleaver. From Zora Neale Hurston to Alice Walker. The Little Rock Nine, the Greensboro Four. The names are endless, as are each of their contributions to the overall Black liberation movement and the Black radical tradition. But what does it mean to be radical? In organizing spaces, as most of you know or have experienced, we go back and forth on this word often. As I understand it, to be radical is to be extreme or militant or combative. Some might even say rebellious, unreasonable, or fanatical. Some days I'd argue that we are none of those things, that we are merely doing what we need to do, not only to survive, but to find liberation. Today, however, I am arguing that we are exactly all of those things. We are extreme because we have to be. We are unreasonable because white supremacy and anti-Blackness cannot be reasoned with. We are rebellious because it is who our ancestors taught us to be. We are combative because our enemy, this white supremacist, capitalist, imperialist patriarchy, word to bell hooks, wouldn't hesitate to take us all out if we were not always willing and ready to fight. That is who we are. Resilient, even though we should not have to be, and perhaps even when we cannot be. And so if that makes us radical or excessive, then it's simply an honor to carry on in the tradition of the folks who fought before us with a singular mission to free Black folks from chains. Our history is rich and each of us have endless examples to pull on to inform our work in spite of what our specific disciplines may be. Whether your work is in police and prison abolition, reproductive justice, trans and queer justice, housing justice, environmental justice, sex work and HIV decriminalization, or any other liberatory effort, there is work and words from our elders and ancestors that we can pull on. What each of the aforementioned thinkers and scholars and organizers and activists have in common, aside from their blackness, is their ability and commitment to imagining something different for themselves. Whether they were prose writers, academics, or poets, activists who took up arms, or nonviolent activists who used different tactics, they each had a commitment to dreaming of something new and working their damnedest to make that a reality. One of the greatest things white supremacy has stolen from us, in my opinion, is the desire to, to dream, to imagine that something else is possible, to hold fast to that possibility despite what it looks like in the immediate. And yet the South has always been a birthplace for dreams to come alive, for imaginations to roam free. While the North was institutionalizing the police, slaves in the South acted as fugitives on the run from the white men who tried to take them captive with the dream of resisting the institutionalization that would surely give those same men more power to hunt them down. While white people insisted on keeping black folks from ever learning to read or write, Many of us imagined that, they, that we could do both and did. They wrote with such conviction and with much vigor and wrote then what many of us still lean on today. Du Bois on voting, 
and Angela Davis on prison abolition both come to mind. While many white people abused our bodies with their fists and their guns and demanded that we lay down and take it, many of us imagined what fighting back could look like and made that a reality. The Black Panther Party, while founded in Oakland, California, was built by Black Southerners, a testament of how widespread the radical Black Southern tradition truly is. I started organizing in 2014. That year, Eric Garner, Mike Brown, Tamir Rice, and a lesser known name that made a great impact on me, Antonio Martin, were all murdered by police across this country. That was also the same year I transitioned out of high school and entered into my first year at Morehouse College. In November, when Darren Wilson skirted an indictment for the murder of Mike Brown, the campus fell silent. Avery Jackson, Zarina Mustafa, and several others saw a need, a need for students to have a place to channel their anger, their sadness, their frustration into something that could benefit us all. So they created a group me, named it hashtag AUC shut it down after the shut it down ATL collective. And in January, 2015, they held their first meeting. I attended. Leaning into the history of the black radical Southern organizing tradition, I knew that this was something I needed to do. This wasn't a typical campus-based organizing group. We knew that as college students living and studying in the heart of one of the most historically black areas in Atlanta, the West End, we would need to be in community with its residents, listen to and assist with their needs. Our goal was not to do any charity work. Our goal was to engage in radical organizing with the black residents of the city who, through gentrification and general anti-blackness taught within the AUC, were being harmed just as much by our, by our institutions as they were by the state. So we combined efforts with hashtag it's bigger than you, shout out to Elle who I see is on the call today, which shut it down ATL with BLM Atlanta and several other organizations in the city to combat police violence here, gentrification, and to shake up the general anti-blackness within the city. Many of you may remember and likely participated in actions like Black Brunch ATL or protests around the murders of Nicholas Thomas, Alexia Christian, DeAndre Phillips, and so many others. We phone banked, we sent emails, and we canvassed from door to door. When not working directly in the community, we organized on our campuses. In the AUC, there is an overwhelming culture of queer antagonism trans antagonism and sexual violence. So we organized diligently around these violences. One of the most impactful direct actions for me took place in 2015, just before we took our finals to leave for summer break. That year, we had organized heavily around police violence. So we organized an event called Take the Oath. There were lots of moving pieces for that direct action but the focal point was indeed the oath. We'd found the oath that Atlanta police take at the end of their program and we rewrote it. We wrote it to center our community with the demand that whosoever took that oath would be committing themselves to caring for, showing up for, and always working alongside the communities in which we live. We knew then at 18 and 19 years old that the only safety and protection we would ever receive would have to come from us, from community, and so we moved to make the police oath null and void. What they swore to do would never be aligned with our best interest. That, like much of the organizing done by the Atlanta student movement, was a radical reclamation of our own narrative and our own story. In that same vein, continuing in the tradition of the Atlanta student movement, in the middle of the second semester of 2015, we protested one of the most prominent US politicians in modern history, Hillary Clinton. During her presidential election run, Hillary Clinton, like so many other presidential hopefuls, went on an HBCU tour. 
when we were made aware of the fact that she was coming to the AUC, we knew that we had to do something and we planned it in a matter of days. Up until that point, Hillary had not been protested against and therefore had not been directly pressed for her war crimes, her investment in the hyper-policing of black communities, nor her more general anti-blackness. On the day of her arrival, <laughs> nine students from Morehouse and Spelman, most of us queer and or trans, rushed into a sea of liberals singing Janelle Monet in Wonderland's Hell You Talking About. Y'all know that song. <laughs> Almost immediately, that crowd full of white liberals, black HBCU students, an overwhelming amount of black celebrities, and even a few black civil rights icons drowned us out with loud boos and chants to let her speak. We switched gears and began chanting Black Lives Matter as it was clear that this protest was going to soon take a very violent turn. Hillary sounded off into the microphone saying, yes, black lives do matter. And I'll tell you about it if you let me speak. But Hillary had been speaking. She is a career politician, married to a career politician who was also a former president. She was first lady, a Senator and the secretary of state. And yet here she was standing in one of the most historic sites in the US in front of a crowd of mostly white liberals who had taken hundreds of seats from actual black students whose votes she was already claiming. And unlike her initial promise, the talk was a speech and not a town hall. So we had no reason to let her speak. And what we experienced after that was a mountain of violence. World famous people like Usher Raymond, <laughs> John Wilson, Morehouse's former president, and even our beloved John Lewis stormed around us begging us to stop protesting her, proclaiming that Hillary was our friend and even going as far as grabbing a few of us by the arm, by the waist and by the shoulder in an attempt to pull us away. After a while, Kasim Reed, Kasim, <laughs> Kasim Reed <laughs> and John Lewis joined Hillary on stage to showcase their support of her over us. Soon after, Atlanta police and Clark Atlanta University's police dragged three of my friends outside. Those of us who remained were threatened to be slammed and arrested by Secret Service, were threatened to be arrested by APD, and were all soon dragged from the auditorium as the audience erupted into a loud and thunderous applause. Once outside, Usher and another one of our beloved civil rights icons, Andrew Young, along with several members of Hillary's staff, berated us, argued with us about our position and verbally assaulted us for daring to care about black lives in a way that they called too radical. Something that both Andrew Young and John Lewis were just being referred to just a couple decades prior. This event and John Lewis's public denouncing of our actions following the event launched us into an entirely new world, one filled with death threats, constant harassment, plummeting grades, and deteriorating mental health. We knew the possible outcomes from doing an action of that magnitude, and we were happy to make the sacrifice. But there was something eerie and, and, and hard about being shunned by the very people who laid the foundation for that type of action. I learned a lot from that, and I am still learning a lot from that. But the two things I learned that matter in this moment is that decentralized leadership is not easy, but it is necessary. And rest can be radical too. At the dawn of my tenure as a community organizer in Atlanta, seven years ago, <laughs> the people with whom I organized all agreed that it was important that we create a non-hierarchical leadership structure shared resources, more room for collaborative projects, no formal leadership roles and collective power for all. We were, as we thought, committed to creating spaces wherein everyone who cared to have input had the room to do so. We were trying to move away from what we saw as flaws in former movements while adding to the collective black liberation movement. 
What we did not realize, however, was that because of the ways that capitalism teaches us all to work vertically with rigid tiers of authority within an organization, there would be a lot more work required for us to effectively cultivate spaces that were actually unranked. We have witnessed the horrors of more vertical leadership structures in previous movements. In 1968, during what would become the eventide of the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King Jr., who had tacitly and explicitly been named the leader of the movement, was assassinated by the US government. Much of King's work was centered around voting rights in the South, but after the signing of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, that changed. The Watts riots, which according to James R. Ralph Jr., was the turning point for King's organizing focus, transpired just days after the Voting Rights Act was signed. From that moment until his assassination, King demonstrated a commitment to a politic that was in direct opposition to the doxile politic that had been assigned to him for so long, effectively making him a threat to the state. Two years prior to King's assassination, Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale founded the Black Panther Party. Newton and Se Newton and Seale ushered in the Black Power era, which would serve as the next iteration of the overall Black liberation movement. The Black Panther Party grew, and in 1968, shortly after transitioning out of the NAACP, Fred Hampton became the chairman of the Illinois Black Panther Party chapter, as well as the deputy chairman of the national chapter. One year later, in December 1969, Hampton was assassinated by the Chicago Police Department and the FBI at only 21 years old. In 1973, Asada Shakur and two other members of the Black Liberation Army were in a shootout with police. Between 1973 and 1977, Shakur was on trial and eventually convicted of the murder of the officer who was shot that night. In 1979, she escaped from her life sentence in prison, fled the United States, and started anew in Havana, Cuba. And now, since the height of the Ferguson protest in 2014, at least six people who were in the thick of the uprisings there have been found dead. While the Ferguson uprisings were not necessarily a moment in which a prominent person was appointed or held as the leader, Many people held prominent roles that made them stand out amongst the crowd. It is those people who have sporadically and randomly been reported as missing and or found dead. Because of COINTELPRO, which is a counterintelligence program operated by the FBI designed to track, harass, discredit, and murder radical Black movement leaders like King and Hampton, members of the Ferguson community have labeled these acts of violence as targeted attacks by police. I and the folks I organized with knew this history. We also knew that this meant we would need to be intentional about how we organized in the next iteration of this moment and of this movement. This became even more clear as the Black Lives Matter movement began to kick up and people like DeRay McKesson and Sean King started to be named as leaders. As time progressed, we'd come to understand that individual leadership in a movement is not only unsafe, but can so often compromise our collective liberation. Appointing specific individuals as leaders of a movement being maintained by tens of thousands of people, of people across the US gives those individuals access to money and other resources to advocate for solutions that are unhelpful to local organizers. If the collective is advocating for defunding police and total abolition and facing direct repercussions from the state for doing so, while appointed leaders are advocating only for reform, the demands of the movement are placed on hold for the sake of the individual. But more than that, a leaderless movement is more easily sustained our ancestors knew this too. 
If not for abolitionists like Frederick Douglass, Thomas Garrett, Martha Coffin Wright, and William Steele, Harriet's work with the Underground Railroad would not have been sustained for over a decade as it was. Without the support of others held captive, Nat Turner would have had no rebellion to lead. In so many ways, these sustained efforts were not only done through shared leadership, but also by a commitment to community and community safety. That's part of the value of the South and how it shows up in our most radical organizing. We understand that to build and sustain movements, you must first be in community with the people for whom you are fighting to free. Typically, when one or just a few people are doing all of the work, it's easier for the entire collective to burn out all at once, halting progress. In a movement without individual leaders, everyone is a leader, by which I mean everyone is empowered and equipped with the required tools to step up into organizing roles. Because of this, fewer people experience burnout and it's much less likely that everyone will burn out all at once. This means that a movement can't and won't stop when a person needs to rest. When I started organizing, and especially after that direct action against Hillary Clinton, I was taught that to add any real value to the movement, I must commit more of myself than my body would actually allow. Taught that if I wanted to do impactful work, then I must take on every facet of the work and settle for the fact that rest was simply not an option almost as though I was a martyr in training. So along with the core organizers, I was at every meeting, every event, every direct action. I took care of logistics, communications, base building, and more. Just a year prior, I was diagnosed with a chronic heart condition, major chronic depression disorder, and severe anxiety. But because I wanted to prove my commitment, despite how much my body begged me to rest, I persisted. It was that persistence and unwillingness to rest that would eventually lead to my second heart surgery, just months before turning 20 and only two years after my first heart surgery. As I recovered, I noticed that it was not more people who were stepping up to fill my role, but that the other core organizers ended up taking on more tasks. This is when I realized that part of being an effective organizer and part of what makes a movement sustainable as our Southern elders also recognized is training enough other people as organizers so that tasks continue to be dispersed equitably, even and especially when your body tells you to rest. Organizing, raw and radical organizing is not easy. It is about engaging the communities around you it places an emphasis on political education. It is about determining and working through the logistics for protests. It is about developing campaigns and programs which target both community members as well as local and state governments. There is canvassing, there is digital strategy, there is cultural work, there is physical outreach, there is, and there is, and there is. Because it is so much, rest is as necessary as base building in order to be an impactful organizer. This means that insofar as radical organizing is a response to our subjugation, rest without apology and that does not need any reasoning is radical too. In the South, we work and we work hard, but most of us grew up in homes where on Sundays, other than going to church, we rested. <laughs> it was central to our perhaps unnamed politic and our way of life. Or when it stormed outside and grandma said that God was talking. So all the lights and all the electronics went off and you had no choice but to sleep. That's radical too, because it is teaching us that eventually storms end and sometimes all you can do is rest. And at some point the storm will end, but you don't have to be in the middle of it when it does. 
The movement doesn't need martyrs. The movement needs people committed to honoring their bodies and their wellness. As such, a leaderless movement is one that not only keeps black folks as safe as one can be from state surveillance and policing, but it also creates a container to hold all of these moving pieces at once. The first time I witnessed this in Atlanta was in 2016. Alton Sterling and Philando Castile were murdered on back-to-back -back days and around the country, uprisings ensued. Here in Atlanta, on any given day, there were anywhere between 2,000 to 10,000 people protesting in the streets. Protests organized by different groups began to pop up around the city. Many of y'all were here, y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> There was no real coordination, no one was necessarily in sync, and ironically, nothing was necessarily organized. Yet, arrests were few, harm done within the crowds was minimum, and Black rage sustained itself in this way for seven days. The role of the trained or seasoned organizer at that moment was not to police how Black folks showed up in the streets, but rather to spread ourselves and the knowledge that we have to ensure that little to no black folks were harmed. At a direct action, this looks like airdropping graphics and other digital materials with bail fund numbers and safety tips for new protesters. It looks like communicating with the people around you, especially the people you do not know to make sure they feel safe. It means having white and other non-black people creating barriers around the crowd to protect black folks who are protesting. It means communicating with the people who are doing digital organizing work to make sure that the necessary information is being more widespread. Overall, it means being intentional about building community, even if only for that moment, so that we keep as many people safe as possible. The murder of George Floyd has led to ongoing months long uprisings across the nation. They've been in his honor, as well as Breonna Taylor's, Ahmaud Arbery's, Tony McDade's, and a host of other names turned hashtags. Just as they were in 2016, the uprisings here have been continuous, sporadic, and beautifully chaotic. Because I have a compromised immune system and COVID-19 is ever present, I was mostly engaging in digital organizing as opposed to being physically in the streets. There was one night though, where police were particularly aggressive with folks in the physical streets. This was the night that the Wendy's where Richard Brooks was murdered by Atlanta police burned. My organizing community was stretched across the city. This was the biggest and roughest night we'd experienced since the start of the uprisings. I couldn't allow myself to not jump in and help where I could. So I went to one area in the city with my friend L, and so much of the environment was different from the 2016 moment. A handful of people had megaphones and several others had varying protest tactics. I was reminded then that a leaderless movement was not only possible, but necessary. While it is not strategic for a large number of people to attempt to lead a protest at once, this did prove that more people were committing themselves to the movement. It was chaotic, sure, but it was our chaos. Today, we continue to face a wide array of issues. COVID-19, the continuation of police violence, climate change and so-called natural disasters, and so much more. In the midst of this, we could all learn from the South. All across the region, Black organizers, many of us queer and trans, are finding new and innovative ways to push the Black radical tradition forward. We are making abolition a reality. We are fighting hard to maintain and broaden reproductive justice, despite how much politicians are trying to take it away. We are pushing excessively for the decriminalization of sex work, HIV, and drug use. We are fighting intensely for housing justice and for livable wages. These are ideologies we have long stood on and that many people around the country are beginning to benefit from and it wouldn't be possible without the South. Right now, everyone is praising Georgia for helping elect Biden and Harris to office. 
But the South, including Atlanta, still largely lacks the money, access, and resources the North has because no one wants to fund Black radical Southern grassroots organizing. We create whole campaigns, we create whole movements, and we pull huge wins only for us to be looked over and discarded because our work is too radical, our history is tied too closely to slavery, and examples of anti-Blackness are too overt for them to ignore. But anti-Blackness isn't stationed here. And this election proved that. When checking the counties of most blue states, blue states, overwhelmingly the blackest cities are the only blue counties throughout the state. I'm gonna say that again. When checking the counties of most blue states, overwhelmingly the blackest cities are the only blue cities throughout the state. Anti-blackness and white supremacy are global. And right now is the perfect time to fund the work and brilliance of black Southern radicals, not shun us. There is no revolution without black folks in the South and people having the audacity to hop online and degrade the South and therefore all the black folks here because white people chose whiteness as they always do speaks only to how much more work is necessary for us all to understand just how important the South has been and remains. So to end this, I want to return to a quote from 1995 from Andre 3000, where he said, the South got something to say, and we'll keep saying it until the rest of the world hears us. Thank you. Oh my goodness, Deshaun, y'all, I know y'all feeling that. Come on, when you end a keynote with Andre 3000, you know that you have done the Lord's work. <laughs> you know that you have done the Lord's work. Come on, Andre 3000. Good people, please put your, put all the love in the chat, put your hands in the air. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deshaun, for just Thank really you so much. setting us off in the right way, reminding us of the powerful organizing and radical organizing of young people and how young people continue to be the innovators and continue to create those interventions when necessary against all odds and reminding us of the power of the South and reminding us of how important it is for us to invest in ourselves and our own self-care, but also the deepened investments necessary for the South to be able to continue to see and build on the strong winds that we are constantly making that keeps saving this country. Thank yeah. you so much again. Good folks, I know y'all love that just as much as I did. And you know, this night is just gonna keep going. Deshaun set us up perfectly for our next panel that we're about to go into you all. It's the first panel of the conference. And this panel starts at five o'clock PM and it is called Radical Organizing at the Intersections of Our Lives. It is going to be moderated by Gerald Jer Jer Hayes of If, When, How. What's up? That's my homie. I dig her so much. And the panelists include Latasha D. Mays, another, all these are homies. I just have to say this out to everybody. <laughs> Latasha D. Mays, that's my earring. Tanisha McHarris, Adaku Uta, Eva Dickerson, Dar Darian Wendell, and Kai Baiti or Baiti. And if I'm saying your name Kai wrong, I apologize, my love. Please charge it to my head and not my heart because you are brilliant and amazing. So y'all, this panel is about to go down five o'clock PM. So we're gonna give you all a little bit of a break, you know, before you head over into your first panel, but please make sure you take this time. I know you are already going in over there on social media. Keep it going, hashtag justice now 2020. Big up Deshaun and all the amazing things that they just laid out for us, big up all the things that have gone on so far, post your selfies, let folks know about the panel that you're about to go into. And then we're gonna close things down tonight. We're gonna come back together at 6.15 for a closing. So come back for the closing. So you know how we're ending the night and you know how we're stepping into tomorrow. So come on back. You never know what you're gonna get in the closing. So don't miss that either. So enjoy your first panel. I know it's sure to be powerful. Again, mad love to you, Deshaun. Mad love to all of you who have joined in on Justice Now 2020. Let's keep this Woo! going. See y'all at five o'clock, all right? Thank Peace you. Everybody.